Service Headline News. I'm your host, Marty Smith, and I'm joined by Eric Perrot. What's going on, fellas? And Jake Wall. Hey, guys. <laughs> and we're here to bring you the latest headlines and updates pertinent to all service men and women. So sit back, get informed, and have a laugh as the Swearing and Podcast presents Service Headline News. Today, fellas, we got a guest, retired Air Force Senior Master Sergeant Derek Lucas. Derek, thanks for coming in, man. Thanks for having me, guys. Hey, man, can uh, you start inviting somebody that's not higher ranked than me anymore? <laughs> <laughs> what, what are you talking about? Teapot was a retired tech. Yeah. Yeah, but he got, he, yeah, the trouble thing. He probably would have been a chief or some shit. Well, what about you, <laughs> cop? What happened? It, it pissed me off when they stopped lost me. Oh, that's right. That's <laughs> right. They did. <laughs> That'll do it. Uh, I still appreciate you making senior man. Appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, no shit. He did it. Yeah. Uh, here's a little background. Uh, Derek, you grew up in Lawrence, Maine, right? Lawrence, Massachusetts. Oh, Massachusetts. Sorry. Yeah. Massachusetts. Yeah. I don't know that section of the country, but you do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, joined the Air Force in 89. Tech school at Lowry. Yep. Uh, 2SO. Do they even have that AFSC anymore? Uh, yeah, I believe they do. Yeah. Or has it been like smashed together with something else? But uh, no, no, I think they still have it. Material management. That's um, it. First assignment to Clark, where you got the you got the triple header out there, right? You got the coup attempt, the volcano, and the uh, earthquake. That's it, dude. We were there at the same time. Outstanding. Oh, That's nice. right. Yeah, you guys were. Huh? Yeah. Uh, he was out at uh, 6009th, the training squadron for cops out of Crow Valley. Awesome. Were you there for Mount Pinatuba? Oh, yeah. I was there towards the very end. Mission Essential. Oh, wow. Oh, so you shit. stayed in, yeah, you stayed and packed some of our shit. No, no, I stayed and killed all your dogs and then packed your shit. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. That's right, Dad. If you listen to Eric's. He talks about having to go around and shooting dogs. That was fucking shit. That's <laughs> crazy. Um, but having having listening to Derek's description of all that ash, yeah. that was like snow, right? It was like oh, yeah. snow. Haven in rooms yeah. and everything, just be, from the weight of ash. That's that blows me away. Yeah. It got back to the Subic. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It destroys <laughs> yeah. Clark and Subic, man. Yeah. No, they sent Der- they sent uh Derek out on the boat on oh, his yeah. own recognizance. <laughs> <laughs> Come back if you want to, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, they only brought certain people back from uh Subic back to Clark to help pack shit up. My my ex father in law was one of them. Oh, very cool. That's right. Yeah. That's that's such a great story, man. Yeah. <laughs> didn't didn't get any of your shit. That's funny. Nope. He didn't get any of my shit. <laughs> <laughs> and then later you cross trained out of supply and went into one charlie six space operator eric your favorite and uh and then you retired in 2015 so welcome derek lucas man thanks thanks for having me guys hey you know i used to i had a series of questions that i was sending out to guests and only one guy did it and it was teapot um but i always i i am intrigued uh by the question when when you were first able to move out of the out of the barracks, right? Yeah. Do you remember your first place when you got to move out of the barracks? I do. It was what in was Germany. It? it was in Germany in night. Uh, let me see. I got to in the Philipp. Well, actually, if you, I did live off base in the Philippines. If you want to count that, I lived in Panetta Compound. I don't know if Eric. Yeah, but you were living compound. with a you were with a girl, right? No, no, but no. We, but you so, were still in the barracks, though, right? Yeah, yeah, I still had a room in the barracks, but I had a place off off base as well. Yeah, <laughs> right on. <laughs> Some yep. ghost in action. I but, like it. But all right, but so what's the, the Germany dorms, one? But out of the dorms for good was first time in Germany in 1994. By yourself, um, or did you go with a group of guys? No, no, just by, uh, by myself because I was getting, um, I was getting married to my ex-wife. And she was coming over from Tampa, actually. My ex-wife's from Tampa, by the way. That's a small world. Holy shit. Damn, ex-wife yeah, she, and all. That's what she I'm went talking to, about. 
<laughs> she went to King King High School, I think it's called King, right outside McGill. Yeah, I know exactly where it is. We played them in football. I went to Tampa Bay Tech. Oh, okay. The vocational school right down the road from King. Oh, all right. Yeah. So she uh she was coming to Germany. So I got married in uh, 94, and that's when I got to move out of the dorms for the first time. You remember what you paid for that place? <sighs> oh, but that but back then we we still got a shit ton of cola, and there was still the the German Mach was still around. So yeah, I I never I didn't pay out of pocket. So you know the cola and everything Fucking was a lot. Cola, I forgot all about cola. Yeah, that's right. Uh yeah, I got I got. <laughs> I got cola in uh, Alaska when I moved off base. Oh yeah, shit, yeah. I was gonna tell you, uh, Eric. What was the what was the football thing you played in Turkey? Oh man, it was full contact. Uh, the Super Bowl for that. It was full contact intramural, and we the cops played against Com in the Turkey Bowl. <laughs> in Turkey. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Was- so I played. I played for Spangalam, Eric. Oh, no uh, yeah, played for the Sabers. We uh, when I first got there, we played football till 1995. Very cool. Yeah, I Holy played 82 to 83, and and we didn't travel. It was all intramural for us, but it was still full contact. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, hey, Jake, these two guys are like lost twins. Like they didn't know each other, man. Like, Holy crazy. shit! It's- I already like this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Both of you are two big meatheads, so uh, that, make, that makes a lot of sense. So, <laughs> Eric, what do you got for a day in history? All right, guys, this one's pretty good. Everybody's familiar with it. We older folks are more familiar with it than you are. Uh, anybody ever remember? Uh, <laughs> I think that Operation- was at you, Jake. <laughs> yeah, puppy. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> Operation Rolling Thunder. Anybody familiar with that term? Yeah, that's yep. uh bombing Vietnam, I think, right? Right. Anybody remember yep. why we upped the bombing? Uh, oh, funsies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> the uh M the what was the number, the name of the street, uh the Ho- Hanoi Trail, whatever the hell oh, the, the Ho yeah. Chi Minh Trail. Ho Chi Minh Trail. Yeah. Ho Chi Minh, yep, yep. The name of the street. Yeah, it, was a, <laughs> street. it was a dirt road with some rocks on it. You know, it was a whole network of <laughs> supply lines. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, yeah. <laughs> on and it wasn't exactly February seventeenth. It's actually February thirteenth. But on February thirteenth, nineteen sixty-five, LBJ approves Operation Rolling Thunder because of increased activity on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Um, Operation Rolling Thunder initiated a sustained campaign of aerial bombing against North Vietnam that lasted until November 1968. And if you'll recall, fellas, it was a huge failure. The supplies and all the stuff that traveled down the Ho Chi Minh never ceased, and we never were able to strategically stop it from occurring. So the bombing campaign from 65 to 68, known as Rolling Thunder, was a major strategic failure. No shit. Yep. Huh. Um, the other thing, I had a couple other reasons for it, too. There were four chief objectives of the bombing campaign, and some of these you may not have heard. One, and I love this one, was to bolster the sagging morale of the pro-American Saigon regime. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so Sagging-er. they figured if we blew the hell out of them, they'd have, their morale would be better. Saggy. Yeah. Saggy morale. Didn't do us any good, but sagging morale. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other one uh, that to destroy North Vietnamese transportation system, their industrial base, and their air defenses. Uh, we talked yeah. about those in depth. The SAM sites, right, right, um, and was in the hopes of taking those out. But it was a major strategic failure, which I always thought uh, Rolling Thunder was a success. Well, I know they had Rolling Thunder, and there was like line. Didn't they have like linebacker and a couple other campaigns? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Those were all bombing campaigns too. Um, yep. But they wouldn't like. I, I I don't know. They wouldn't. They had so many restrictions on that shit, and uh, it's no wonder it wasn't a, a success. So. Yeah. 
Huh. Interesting. That's a good one. Yeah. I could have uh, chosen much more into it, but I chose not to. Nah, that gets too <laughs> that gets too deep. That's a, that's good enough. All right. All right, let's see. A first story. Uh gentlemen, we finally have a Coast Guard story. I know oh, nice. sometimes it gets old making fun of the Space Force all the time. So I thought I thought we'd have a change of pace. <laughs> Uh, okay, last Friday, oh, I was going to ask you, Jake, if you know this area. Last Friday, uh, the Coast Guard saved this guy who got thrown off a yacht. Uh, it was at the yes. mouth of the Columbia River, uh, yep. separates the states of Washington and Oregon. It's popularly known as the Graveyard of the Pacific. Yeesh. Yeah. Do you know that? Have you been there? Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, rough out there. Yeah, it says wow. the area is known Super. for... It's extremely powerful currents and very rough seas that become too difficult for even the most experienced sailors to navigate. So it's like two rivers come there and it's just all big, an inlet. It is a massive inlet um, between the states and it is like a bunch of rivers join up upstream and then there's constantly rapids and high winds and rain and all that kind of stuff up there it's just crazy um so last friday at about 10 a.m coast guard was conducting routine training nearby when they got a rescue call from a yacht and used radio tower triangulation that's pretty cool uh to fix the yacht's location the coast guard dispatched a 47 foot motor lifeboat and an mh-60 jayhawk helicopter uh and the air crew of the Advanced Rescue Helicopter School launched from Coast Guard Station. Listen to this one. You probably know it, Jake, but I was like, this is a horrible name. Coast Guard Station, Cape Disappointment. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Fucking hey, how many how many rescues are coming out of Cape Disappointment? It's like, man, nah, don't get your hopes up, buddy. <laughs> uh, the rescue team was able to locate the yacht, which was taken on water. Uh at the time, there were 20-foot seas at the location, so that's pretty massive. Uh, Coast Guard deemed the seas too rough for the rescue lifeboat, so they alerted the rescue swimmer. Now, I don't know how I don't know how Coast Guard rank goes, but this guy sounds pretty low. Aviation this is his first mission. Wasn't his first mission? It was right? his first mission. Yeah, he was trained. Oh, he just man. got out of school. Aviation survival technician, third class, uh, John Walton, which is kind of funny. John Walton, who was on his first rescue mission after just graduating from the Coast Guard's rescue swimmer program. A rescue winch then lowered Walton from the helicopter as he neared the vessel. The captain of the boat identified as 35-year-old Jericho Labonte of Victoria, British Columbia, climbed onto the yacht's stern, prepared to get in the water. But the yacht at that time was hit broadside by a huge wave that slammed it, throwing the guy into the water. Uh, and that flipped the boat completely around. So the rescue swimmer uh, saw the wave approaching. He did whatever defensive thing you're supposed to do. Uh, then he located the captain. Uh, he got him on. He got him hooked in, and they brought him in a helicopter, and they went to Coast Guard Station Astoria, where he was treated for a slight case of hypothermia. After the guy had been stabilized and the Coast Guard released him, then the authorities, the police called the Coast Guard and said that this guy was suspected of having stolen the yacht. And it was <laughs> it was afterward it was afterward learned that Labonte was also wanted for crimes in Canada. Local authorities put out an APB on him. They arrested him, uh, but not before somebody who knew the guy had alerted the police to some weird video he had posted on social media of him leaving a fish at the house from the Goonies and then dancing crazily around the property. <laughs> and then he went and stole the yacht. <laughs> this is the best part. Uh, police chief added that Labonte had a weird fascination with the Goonies film. You guys guess what he said when the police arrested him thinking of the Goonies film. Guess what the guy said to the police? Hey, you guys. Hey, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck it. He did the uh, oh, chunk, man. the chunk yell. Chunk. John Matuzak. <laughs> yeah, that hey, was Matuzak. That's right. That was Matuzak. Yeah, it was John Matuzak. Yeah. Uh, 
So he'll be charged with theft, endangering another person, the Coast Guard swimmer, unauthorized use of a vehicle, and criminal mischief for throwing the fish on the porch. (laughs) (laughs) And in Canada, he's wanted for criminal harassment, mischief, and failure to comply three times. So uh, just wanted to bring some Coast Guard, almost all the Coast Guard stories. You know, it's funny when you when you scan all the news stuff right and it's like army uh soldier charged with murder soldier charged with domestic battery you know navy's like three soldiers caught in a drug ring you know it's just constant 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 but if you look down the coast guard headlines they saved three guys here they busted uh 10 million dollars in drugs they did and they're just constantly doing heroic shit so hats off to the coast guard Good stuff. Yeah, Coast Guard, man. They're I honestly think they're underrated. Oh, they're, absolutely. Uh, yeah. They do all I think, kinds yeah. of crazy stuff. Wait, what my my instructor at senior intro academy was Coast Guard. He was awesome. He was uh, Coast nice. Guard and he switched over? No. You they have other services. Oh shit. Just, he was just Coast Guard. Yeah. Yeah, he was Coast Guard. Yep. You know, there was a time when like Coast Guard, I can't remember what it was. I don't know if you guys do, but Coast Guard was under a certain department. And then they switched it. They were like under Department of Transportation or something like that. And then they switched them. And that's when they started doing all the drug interdiction stuff. Oh. And oh, yeah. they got, that's when they started getting all the action. It was really the cool. Boardings, they, they've done a lot of, of yeah. crazy cool things, man. Yeah. And I it maybe we should maybe we should look at that in the next uh in a coming podcast or something, because they have so many different size vessels. And that would be kind of cool to go down through all the Coast Guard vessels, you know. I'll never interview a Coast oh, yeah. Guardsman. It'd be fun, but I would never. I'd love to. Um, <laughs> but, you know, landlocked. So, uh, okay. So, uh, second story. Uh, let's go over to the Chinese spy balloon. Hey, that's a good one. <laughs> all right. So, enough time. What are you guys talking about? <laughs> <laughs> you, know the, you know the first thing I thought of was... The balloon hoax. Remember the balloon hoax? Yeah. It was like two. Yeah. It was uh, 2009. Was the Colorado balloon hoax when they they said the kid went up in the balloon? Yeah. Was, oh yeah, yeah. That yep. was crazy. I mean, I was I was intrigued by it. I was like, no shit. How was that kid up in the balloon? Uh, <laughs> that went on for like a day. That was hilarious. Uh, okay, so let's run down the timeline. This is from the New York Times. So on Saturday, January 28th, the spy balloon starts a controlled drift into American territory, entering Alaskan airspace near the Aleutian Islands. At first, it appears to trackers at U.S. Northcom to be just another one of China's light probes. I don't know what that means. Light probes. Okay, so, so China is constantly doing... They're constantly te- testing the boundaries, okay. like all the time. Yep. Yep. So they they come over and then they're with like, like anything, with random stuff, man. Yeah. Well, um, I, Rem- I well that remember that news article about the Coast Guard interdicting the Chinese and Russian. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You did that story. Yeah. That's right. That was right off the coast of Alaska. Oh shit! They'll get now, as hasn't close- there been balloons beforehand too from those guys? Yeah. That's what I thought. Well, the Japanese started it during World War II. They started it, right? Yeah. I read a, I read a they, bit. They on were launching said, balloons from Japan and bombing the Pacific Northwest during that's, World War II. That's fucking nuts, man! That is crazy. I'd just like to get that mission. Well, no, it it was they it was brilliant because it was so well engineered that they were like, okay, at this point in time, this will deteriorate and it'll drop bombs. Yeah, yeah. And it, it was just unmanned, riding the air currents, and then it, after three days, this will freaking work, and it'll drop random little bombs on the Pacific Northwest. It's pretty clever. I get it, it is. For that. But Shemia, right? Shemia's got a big yep. listening. I don't know what kind of ground radar they have out there. Um, it is Shemia, isn't that how you pronounce it? Yep. Yeah, Shemia. Yep. Um, it's like- so I don't know. I, I'm I'm sure we knew about it, and I've heard some, yeah we did. I've heard some stories that they knew about it, but either they didn't tell them or they told them and they didn't do anything. So anyway, on Monday, uh, by the end of the day, the balloon had exited American territory and is over Canada. 
Officials say carrying its solar panels that power its propulsion and its cameras and surveillance equipment. On Tuesday, January 31st, the balloon re-enters the United States over Idaho to the surprise of officials at NORTHCOM, as well as at the Pentagon. It's like, I mean, I see the big jet stream weather maps. You can see that big swoop, right? It it's be not like it's fast moving either. <laughs> no, no. Uh, an F-22 to knock it down. Well, I'll get to that. Uh, <laughs> Wednesday, February 1st, Bloom makes its way to the skies above Billings, Montana, which alarmed Pentagon officials because of the state is home to the 341st Missile Wing at Malmstrom, uh, one of three U.S. Air Force bases that operate and maintain ICBMs. So, of course... Thursday, February 2nd, there are reports of a second Chinese balloon traveling across Central America. I don't know what the hell they're looking at in Central America. Don't they own like half of Central America by now anyway? Probably. That is headed towards South America. Uh, Saturday, February 4th, the Federal Aviation Administration temporarily pauses departures and arrivals at airports in Wilmington, North Carolina, and in Myrtle Beach and Charleston in South Carolina. So, you know, there were some rich people pissed off that they canceled all those flights over there at Myrtle Beach, <laughs> which the agency said was meant to support the Department of Defense in a national security effort. One of two F-22 jets from Langley fires a sidewinder, uh, downing the balloon, which was flying at an altitude of between 60 and 65,000 feet. Uh, by the time it was shot down on Saturday off the shore of Myrtle Beach, the Chinese spy balloon had traversed the entire country. Uh, so, firstly, Bill, that we need to go back, court martial the F 22 pilot for wasting a full blown Sidewinder missile ah, on a balloon when we could have thrown a couple of rounds at it. I'm glad you brought that up because yeah. there's a, there's an article by sandbox.us. It's kind of a, it's kind of a cool website and it has all these questions and it has these, it has kind of the, uh, propaganda answer but it also has some common sense answers so <laughs> let's do that now how's the balloon shot down balloon shot was shot down uh by an f-22 from the first fighter wing at langley um, u.s territorial waters extend 12 miles out to sea and it was shot down before it exceeded the 12 miles out to sea i don't know why it wasn't shot down before it you know when it first entered 12 miles out to sea in yeah, out like west. Over Montana or something. yeah exactly right right uh, they use an AIM 9X Sidewinder, America's most infrared, which is funny because it's America's most modern infrared guided <laughs> air to air missile. How much heat is that thing putting out? Hey, Marty, what you failed to mention in that article is they probably still wouldn't have shot it down until that civilian guy, Doke, whatever his first name is, who took the picture out in Montana. Started posting the video that's right. of that shit. That's a good point. Yeah, and that's the only reason why they acted on it because they had a way a while to act on it, and they didn't. That's a that's a really good point because that's when it was brought to our consciousness, right? And we're yeah, like, I don't understand why shit. it wasn't an issue before that. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure it was, but they they have some pretty good answers to some of this stuff, like why they didn't shoot it down right away. So uh, let me get to it. Um, but one thing that's interesting is that the F-22 launched this thing at an altitude of 58,000 feet, which is interesting because the F-22's disclosed service ceiling is just listed as simply above 50,000 feet. So Yeah, and, and they're saying that balloon was at, most of the time at 80. 80? I hadn't heard that one. Jesus. Yeah. Yep. Well, right. Isn't that zone? Then they were saying that zone is below where space begins and yep. above most where where most planes can fly. So it's all unregulated, I think. Something like that. But you said it was taken down with an AIM-9, correct? An AIM-9, yeah. All right. Well, listen to this. The AIM-9X is said to cost about $604,000 plus tax and license. So we almost spent a million dollars shooting down a balloon. Eric, an unused weapon is a useless weapon. 
<laughs> wow. If you don't coming from a spacer. If you don't fire hey. it, we can't buy anymore. Hey, hey, let's let's uh let's also mention that you know they already got all the intel they needed, so <laughs> what right, was right. the perfect right. end? Yeah, and I don't really know what intel they're getting. I mean, Jesus, what are, what are they doing? Um they were all I, I'll get to that later, what the what some of the countermeasures were. But uh shooting down China's balloon was indeed the F 22s first air to air kill. <laughs> And it, and it may have, it may have been the highest altitude air to air kill ever. Now, whoever that pilot was, he's walking around with a big dick. I mean, he's like, "Come on, boys, what do you got?" Oh shit! <laughs> Must promote, right? Is, is he or is he a joke? <laughs> well, because well, they're like, okay, let's send him after the balloon. What what were those maneuvers? How, what was that balloon doing? <laughs> <laughs> An unarmed, unmaneuverable balloon. <laughs> yeah, maybe they said it? they said the probably worst missed guy it with the gun the first time, and then he's like, "I gotta <laughs> use him." <man." laughs> Could have been. It's a good point. Uh, it says uh, another question: Did the balloon collect valuable intel for China? And the propaganda answer is short. Answer is no. Defense officials have been clear that steps were taken to mitigate the system's ability to collect or relay any data. So I didn't know this. They didn't publicize this, but um, they sent an RC-135 rivet joint up there. And so it was it was sitting out there probably flying right along with it. I don't know if the rivet joint has, has counter stuff or if it's just all Intel collection. So... But no, it has stuff. Yeah. So I'm sure we were up there. I don't know what, you know, nobody knows what the payload is. We probably never know what the payload is. But so they had a river joint in there. So that's that's kind of cool. Did they recover it? Uh, I haven't. I haven't. I was looking for that. They haven't recovered anything yet. Or at least if they have, they haven't publicized it. No, I think they have, Marty. I think I saw a picture yeah. of a raft with some military guys recovering, pulling it out of the water. What they get? Yeah. Did it say what they got? No, it looked like just the, the balloon portion. The, <laughs> yeah, balloon. The, the, pro, the problem is they did it over the, the water. Right, right. Where it's, it's it's electrical shit, so it's probably ruined. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got the balloon part. They're like, thanks, bud. Good job. We'll put you in with the pilot who shot it down. Get you guys all defense medals for that. Uh, what if the balloon had been carrying an EMP or nuclear weapon? Now I heard some of that talk and I, and the first thing I thought of was like, that's gotta, I mean, I don't, I don't know what advances in technology, but to produce an EMP, that's a shitload of power, right? You got to have some big equipment to do that. Well, this art, yeah. go ahead. Okay. Well, I was just going to say, then they were talking about, you know, with the COVID, they, you know, was it, uh, Bioenvironmental too in the balloon. That would make shit more like that. sense. They were, they were coming up with all kinds of stuff. That would make more sense. They're like, hey, here's all our shit from the lab in the balloon. Special, special delivery for you, America. Love you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, EMPs can damage electronic devices over large swaths of ter- territory, but the amount of energy required to do so is immense. Uh, And in fact, the most feasible way to affect an entire region of the United States with an EMP would be to detonate a nuclear weapon. So that's uh, the fact of the matter is if China were were interested in detonating a nuclear weapon over the United States, missiles would be far more effective means of doing so. Yeah, that's true. Unlike balloons, missiles allow for a much higher degree of precision and are much harder to intercept. So I agree with that. but it w- it would be a a cheap little trash can way to cause a lot of havoc, or to make our government look like dumbasses like they already do. <laughs> right. Uh, okay, here you go, Eric. Why use an expensive missile to shoot a balloon down? <laughs> yeah, I'm asking that question. So, believe it or not, using less expensive guns against a similar balloon has proven ineffective in the past. In 1998, two Canadian CF-18s were dispatched to intercept a runway weather balloon of similar size. The two fighters fired more than a thousand 20 millimeter rounds uh, from their Vulcan autocannons at the balloon, 
which amounts to nearly the full magazine carried by these jets. Despite poking lots of large holes in a balloon, it remained airborne and continued to float for days after. Okay. So mm. they shot a half a million dollar uh, yeah, missile at it. Yeah, missile. Yeah, got it. <laughs> so what? if this all a uh, practice run for a future attack, uh, if another balloon was headed for the U.S. airspace next week, that really did appear to pose a threat, then the U.S. would take different action. Uh, but let's say this, let's give this a benefit of the doubt, if the Chinese balloon was hypothetically a test run for future balloon attacks, and the last thing the U.S. would want to do would be to show its hand and demonstrate exactly how it would respond to such a threat. All right, I get that, but that does sound like a little bit of propaganda, though, doesn't it? No. Nope. Yes. It's like, oh, we didn't shoot it down because we don't want to tell them what we what we'd really do. Well, you'd shoot it down, you know. What else? What other choice you got? I think that's a bunch of crock. And also, yeah, I kind of thought so too. I don't think they even freaking found it or knew it was there until it was way over Montana. I think they knew it was there. Now think of how the military runs, right? They, they, well, I read I read reports that it was there, went back over Canada, and then came back again. Yeah, it was definitely maneuverable. Right, they said it hovered, it yeah. it loitered over Montana for a while. Yeah, um, all the all the all the ICBM bases, of course. Yeah, but but think of how the military works, Eric. They knew it was there, and they're like, "Oh shit, do I want to? Do I want to? If I if I report this, <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so God knows how many layers. I, I'm sure there's some fuck ups in there." Uh, especially when the guy who's filming it from the ground is like, "Hey, look at this, everybody!" Like, like Derek said, put it out on fucking Twitter, and everybody's like, "Oh shit!" And then the mil and the military is like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa! What do we got here?" <laughs> yeah. Oh, quick, play dumb. Yeah, right. Well, they, well, then, well, then they then they tried to say three of those happened during the Trump years. So yeah, you know, and that's, that's and that's hard to believe too. They have happened in the past, though. They they did say it it has happened, but in the they past. did they but yeah, but they didn't spend as much time yeah. over the United States as this one. I I bet you though, honestly, yeah. Okay, is Marty was there an like an so we do international waters, right? Is yeah, there, twelve miles. Yeah, what's the line between international space, oh, international airspace, and? No, our, they violated our sovereignty. It's, they violated our sovereignty. It's, yeah, they did. Oh, yeah. I don't, I'm not but saying they did. I know just, you're talking about vertically up from our country, right? Yeah. Yeah. It seems like I've because we, we fly U 2s, right? Right. And they shot it down. <laughs> well, well, <yeah. laughs> it did. And they shot it one, down. <laughs> one time out of, yeah. The well, that's the only thousands. one they caught. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, that's the only one they caught. But yeah. that was like an that's like an old law now, right? The old international law of so many feet, and I can't remember how far up it is. Um, but maybe it's above sixty thousand. Maybe that's why they were doing it. They're like, "Hey, we're not touching your space, buddy." <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I'm pretty sure the U two was higher than that, by the way. Yeah, they were. They were. Uh, oh yeah, those, shit, I can't those remember poor off. pilots. Um. You know, it wouldn't surprise me if one of those were flying around this balloon, gentlemen. Yeah. Wouldn't surprise wouldn't, me. Yeah. Yep. It's it's way above that though. It flies higher than that. Yeah. 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 I'm just saying, yeah. in, in response to this, it wouldn't surprise me if a U two was trying to collect whatever was on the balloon either. You know, pictures, what 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 is it? Yeah. What's it carrying? What's on it? You know, what kind of devices are they trying to collect off us? Equipment. I'm sure. I think I think it was just. I'm pretty sure what that's what the RJ can do though. Yeah, they, they got right. all the same. That's shit what the that, rivet yeah. does. Right? Yep, it does. I'm pretty sure they're just like, hey, go build a couple ten thousand dollar balloons and go fuck with the Americans. <laughs> yeah, go fuck with go fuck that's with Joe. True. Go fuck with yeah, Joe. Yeah, and we'll just watch. We'll just watch and giggle. Does it drop ice cream? <laughs> <laughs> Here's the best part. Right, and I got this from Soldier of Fortune on uh, dot com. You bet, Soldier of Fortune is still out there. Can you believe that? I remember reading Holy it a shit. long time ago. <laughs> I, re I remember that magazine. Yeah, right, right. And in the back, yeah. it was all the mercenary ads. You know, it's like, hey, come to yeah. you know this hot country. chicks firing guns. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was the other that was their other bread and butter. <laughs> Bandoliers and breasts. Right on. <laughs> um. 
Okay, so the 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 two Raptor pilots that went up there, uh, they took their calls. They were they were their call signs were Frank zero one and Frank zero two, oh, and this was in honor. This is cool. This was in honor of First Lieutenant Frank Luke Junior, who destroyed fourteen German observation <laughs> balloons in World War One. <laughs> I was like, how That's badass awesome. is that? That is awesome. It's very creative, man. Oh, wait, wait, wait. So he can shoot down a balloon with a piddly old freaking gun. Right. Oh, gun yeah. Very not good. Shoot through the propeller, but we can't shoot down a balloon with a Vulcan. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Break. Okay. Uh, anything left on the balloon? We got anything on the balloon? Yep, have a we, million dollar have we run out of time on the balloon? All right. <laughs> okay, so Derek, tonight we continue on with our all-star military team. All right. So to recap so far, our all-star battleship was the USS New Iowa. Oh, no, it was I thought it, I thought it was New Oh Jersey. shit, it was oh, no, New Jersey. Iowa. That's right. New Jersey. New Jersey. <laughs> Iowa. Yeah, I listened to that. It was New Jersey. That's right. Jake had the uh, the Iowa, right? Yeah. Iowa yeah. class. Um, the uh, the All Star tank was the M four Sherman, and the All Star jet is the F fifteen. So, so tonight it's American military rifles, and Derek, since you're our guest, you get to cast the deciding vote. After you hear our arguments, you get to choose the rifle All Star. So, Derek, I'm just saying Philippines, football, big guys. You go back a long way, bro. Oh, okay? Jesus Christ. And you, and you both got to uh, you, you both got the tongue out over Brady. So there you go. <laughs> All right. Jake hasn't yet chose a rifle. So I'm going to go first to one. give. Oh, you got well, one now. You're chronologically, you're first. Okay, chronologically, I'm first. <laughs> All right, I chose a Spencer rifle. Uh, the Spencer rifle gave the Union Army a significant tactical advantage during the Civil War with a firing rate of 20 rounds per minute compared to two to three rounds per minute of the Confederates' muzzle loaders. Hmm. Ironically, the Department of War balked at having troops use a Spencer initially because they thought they'd waste too much ammo. It was a magazine gun. It fired copper case cartridges. Seven were held in the weapons buttstock. Because the cartridges were rim-fired, there was no need to prime the rifle. And they just decimated the South once they issued them out. They supplied 106,000 of the Spencer rifles to the Union war effort. I'm choosing the M1 Grand. Most popular. Um, First off, world. it's Gorand. <laughs> go Rand. Jesus Christ. Go. Uh, you lose points for mispronunciation. All right. M I'll use the uh, M1 rifle. Oh, yeah. Um, Chicken it shit. was the first semi automatic rifle issued and uh, made popular in World War II and the Korean War. That's right. Wasn't in any wars in the Philippines, so I can't solicit points during that. <laughs> I mean, it was in the Dominican Civil War, so it's an island. You know, Everything was in a civil war. Jesus yeah, Christ. Yeah, that is true. <laughs> um, it's the characteristic one where uh, you hear that pink right at the end. but it, the, I can't what, imagine, Which means you're empty. Yeah, exactly. I can't imagine carrying everything, including this gun, and it's like 11 and a half pounds. God damn. You know? It's a it's club. Ridiculous. It's a club. Yeah. Those guys running around with this thing were those those World War II vets were machines. I can't understand. Yeah, it. that's. A, I mean, but they had you no know? choice, right? They're like, here, carry exactly. this fucking eleven pound dead weight with you. And yeah. Like, okay. Exactly. So you could also fix bayonets, um, but it was the thirty uh, out six Springfield cartridge. Um, it's a big bullet too. Yeah. It, it's the seven, basically the NATO equivalent. Seven six two, yeah. Seven six two, yeah. So. You up, man. All right, uh, Eric, do your best. Try to get this captured audience to listen. Right on. So I was torn. I thought the M14 was a badass weapon and liked looking at it the way it looked. I was like, damn. I started researching. 
that freaking thing was a huge failure. Oh, so shit. I started, it was terrible. <laughs> it really was. In Vietnam, the water, the heat, it sweated, it, you know, all kinds of problems. So really? anyway, I started looking and I found one that I thought was really cool. And it was the precursor to the Garant. It's the M1903 Springfield. Oh. Oh, it's okay. badass. Caliber 30 out 6, model 1903, five round magazine, bolt action service repeating rifle. And oh, by the way, its first use in combat was during the Philippine American War. <laughs> oh, <shit. laughs> Just a- there you go. It was officially adopted by the U.S. military in June 19, 1903. Um, it was a badass gun. It, uh, Philippine American War, the Banana Wars, Mexican, I mean, multiple, multiple engagements up to World War II, where it was replaced by the Grand. However, still in service to this day as a sniper rifle. Yep. Yep. What was its caliber? It was 7.62, right? 7.62, same thing. Yep. But still in service today as a sniper rifle. I wanted to give you a piece of this. Um, The M1903 was the U.S. Army sniper rifle of choice during Second World War II, even over the Korean. Um, (laughs) It had a red-filled scope mount. As well as a as a uh, position for a uh, a uh, bayonet. This thing led all the way through one to counter Germans Mal- Germany's Mauser, and it was a great warfare weapon because it had five rounds to engage. Huh. So good weapon, my choice. Springfield 1903. You know, I I, I suppose one of us should probably chose the M16. I know. So I, w- I was wondering why nobody did. You know, yeah, you could submit the M16, Derek, if you'd like. So the M16 was in response to the abysmal performance of Eric's previous rifle. Choice. No, the M14. M14. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was it was a quick release, like response to hey, these are horrible. We really need to fix it. And like yeah, you said, like, like you said last, there's something plastic. <laughs> like you said last week, Jake, we are just one big arms dealer because we've sold M16 oh. fucking everywhere. Oh, yeah. Everywhere. Right. Everywhere. For sure. Yeah. All right, Derek. Yeah. It's not as pro- 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 prolific, excuse me, That's as true. the AK. No. But no. Um, yeah, it, it's just, it's everywhere. <laughs> All right, Derek. You can either choose one of our three or you can throw a wild card in there, but we will go with your decision. (laughs) Oh, now he figured out how to mute it. (laughs) Yeah, he is muted. There he is. Again, am I unmuted now? Hold on. Yeah, that was you, man. I didn't mute you this time. Yeah, it's my ear. It keeps doing that. Anyway, (laughs) all riveting. Shut your mouth up there. All riveting stories. Uh, I'm going to go with Marty Spencer Rifle. There you go. Let me tell you Atta why. Boy. I'm, from, I'm, from, I'm from Boston. I'm from the North, you know. So we, you know, whatever it took to take out the South, I'm all for that. There you go. Good <laughs> choice. Good choice. Spencer <laughs> Rifle it is. Uh, nice. I'm not nice. This. I thought we were friends, Derek. I'm sorry, Eric. You, right. you, you were very close. Very close. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why don't you guys go to the gym and pump each other? Ooh, nice. <laughs> wow, that's an oldie but a goodie. Ah, that's an oldie but a goodie. <laughs> a small little short guy's got to say something like that. <laughs> <laughs> On oh, behalf man. of all of us here today, I'd like to thank you for listening. Please like, share, subscribe, and let us know how we did in the comments. And as always, make sure to download the next episode for more service headline news. Man, I'll see you next week. Derek, thanks for sitting in with us. It was a blast. Uh, be safe driving. Have you have you made it home driving yet? We're, we're almost there, but oh Kristen's God. driving, so it's 50-50. <laughs>
<laughs> that means he's not making it home, Marty. <laughs> ah, hey, I pre- I'm sure you'll edit all this conversation in the vehicle. Uh, I, I, I'll do my best. <laughs> <laughs> Let me have it. I've, I've missed it so. You've only, it's only been a week, man. But this time we had some discussion of some low hangers. And given your age, I'm sure you've got a couple of low hangers. So uh, keep them high and tight, my friend. Do everything you can at the gym. That's perfect. We'll do. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Uh, we'll see you next week. <laughs>